So a very, very warm welcome from Helen and I. This event is part of the Mental Wealth Festival um, 2021. And we've been asked to have a conversation about our artwork and our creative practice and how mindfulness sort of really supports that. So yeah, just thank you for coming. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be able to share it and it's lovely to see, to see you all, yeah. Do you want to say a few words, Helen? Yeah, well, I think I've said what I want to say, which is hello. <laughs> really nice to see you. Some of you I, I recognise, um, know very well, and some of you are new. So just welcome um, to all of you. So this is an experiment. So uh, Claire and I haven't done, we've talked about our artwork and our teaching work together actually many, many times, but doing it in this particular way is new for us. So thank you for um, being willing to uh, engage and um, uh, yeah, look at our work and hear what we've got to say. So shall we, shall we introduce one another? Maybe we'll say a little a few words. So I can go, I can say, introduce Claire. So Claire um, is a full-time artist. She, as many of you know, she's a tutor. Um, she is a and freelance teacher and trainer who lives and works in London. Claire studied at the Royal Drawing School to MA level and uh, has also been practicing mindfulness and meditation for over 20 years. So that includes um, training with breath works as a mindfulness teacher. Um, and from that has devised many, many workshops and courses and retreats exploring this relationship, which I know is her passion, um, but of drawing mindfulness, creativity, and of course the imagination. Um, she works at a variety of places, including the City Lit, where many of you know her from, uh, the National Gallery and Pallant House Gallery. In her artwork, Claire draws inspiration from a range of sources, including the forest, um, her own meditation practice and mindfulness, Buddhist philosophy, and also the science of the mind. So I'm looking forward to hearing um, how those all come together in her, her artwork. She also has a practice of working with natural pigments, which she'll tell you more about, um, forage from plants, rocks and crystals, um, uh, which is part of her understanding of that the mater these natural materials is integral to the vision of human and ecology. Um, and she, she says about her work that it's based on the view that if one enters deeply enough into one's experience, then one finds the universal. Um, so yeah, really looking forward to hearing and seeing more about those those many themes that come together in Claire's work. Thank you, Helen. And yeah, it's a real pleasure to introduce Helen as well. We we actually had studios very close to each other for a number of years. Uh, we just had to walk across a little corridor to see each other. And we actually gave each other tutorials every week for, I think, probably about three years. And I really love Helen's work. And so it's a real pleasure to, to sort of share it today and have this discussion. So Helen grew up in rural Norfolk and uh, she studied illustration at Falmouth and graduated in 2003. She started practicing Buddhism around that time as well and then moved from Norwich to London in 2007 to intensify her Buddhist practice and her art life. And then she did the drawing year. So she also studied at the Royal Drawing School um, at around that time. And Helen also teaches in a variety of locations, including the Royal Drawing School and the City Lit. And she also teaches um, Buddhism and meditation at the London Buddhist Centre and on retreats. Her artwork involves responding to commonplace heightened moments um, and is often based on observation, but hints at uh, more dreamlike experiences. So we'll be entering into the magical world of, of Helen a little bit later on this morning. So. So we, we thought we would start by um, just saying a few 
things about what mindfulness is just for a couple of minutes just a very brief introduction to what mindfulness is i'm imagining that a lot of you have some experience of it because it's so common these days but um so can i ask you helen what what do you if you were to sort of sum it up what would you say mindfulness is yeah this is nice this is nice because often when um I'm teaching mindfulness. I'm I'm trying to give a really clear definition, but in this case, I feel like I can maybe talk about how my own experience a bit more, which uh, might be less um, directive or something. But uh, my own experience of mindfulness is when I'm carrying out the intention to not look for um, satisfaction in anything other than my current experience. So that means that I'm um, having to notice what my current experience is. Um, deliberately cultivating a sort of uh, curious awareness about what's happening, which moves my mind into a um, much more satisfying uh, state of being than um, the, the other habits of my mind, which are to uh, think about what can I do to feel more fulfilled and to look for that in places um, other than what's immediate. Mm, that's lovely. So in a way, it's a way of sort of looking for fulfillment looking for enrichment through turning towards your everyday like your actual experience and the sort of the value of that yeah 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 and i've, I've learned to trust that 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 does happen you know that's that's a, a rewarding approach yeah yeah what about you claire that's interesting well i've got a definition which i um is there feedback going on here Where's that happening? Shall I try again? Yeah, no, it's still going on. Should we mute everybody? I'll mute myself as well, maybe for a minute. Yeah, if you're not muted, then um, yeah, great. That's better. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I do, I do have this uh, definition which I just really love. Uh, so I'll just say it's from the mindfulness all party parliamentary group so which was given in 2015 and it's it's mindfulness can be defined as paying attention to what's happening in the present moment in the mind and the body and the external environment with an attitude of curiosity and kindness so i'll just say that again so mindfulness can be defined as paying attention to what's happening in the present moment, in the mind, in the body, and the external environment, with an attitude of curiosity and kindness. So I just love that, particularly with the emphasis of um, curiosity and kindness, is sort of like inquisitiveness and openness, as well as the kindness aspect, which is integral, really, to it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, lovely definition, very uh, comprehensive definition. Mm. Um, and so you say, yeah, having had those uh, thoughts from us about what mindfulness is, we can now perhaps move into looking at some images, um, yeah. how, how they relate um, and what else comes from those images. So it's all very well talking about things, but it's nice to look as well. Yeah. So Claire, do you, should we look at some of your work to start with yeah great yeah so um yeah we're gonna we're gonna sort of in a way talk with you uh we talk talk through images today we're going to be sharing our work initially over the next uh, 40 minutes or so we'll be looking at images as we speak and hopefully we'll be drawing out something of the meaning really and significance of of <coughs> of the practices that we do through the artwork. So I'll, scare, I'll screen share now. Sorry, it's coming. 
<laughs> Here it is. A mindful pause. A mm -hmm. mindful pause, yeah, an opportunity there. Okay, just whiz through. Here we go. So hopefully you can each see a a slide now that says drawing mindfulness and creative mm -hmm. practice, a mm -hmm. conversation. If you um if you can't see that, um, just unmute yourself and let us know, but hopefully you can see that. Yeah. Okay. So wanted to, first of all, just share a couple of images with you. Um, as Helen mentioned, I studied at the Royal Drawing School and um, probably spent about three years. Um, it was three years, three days a week drawing from life. And that was a brilliant way of learning about drawing as well as learning about the processes of uh, looking actually. Uh, and a lot of sort of what I do now has come out from that. I'll say more about this um, as we go along. So these are a couple of drawings that I did at that time and a few more here. And um, uh, probably about uh, nine years ago or something, I moved into abstraction. So I worked figuratively for, i.e., you know, drawing things that are recognizable from observation for possibly about 15, 15 years, something like that. And about 10 year, eight to 10 years ago, I moved into abstraction. Um, and I'll sort of try and express why that shift took place uh, over the next period of time over the next 20 minutes or so but here's a few images just to share with you initially um, so these are drawings and um, they're long the ones on the right are like long thin strips and they're mixed media so i work with um, inks and pastels and pencils and really the essence of this is about play for me um so i I've, i sort of really recognize the need um in life really but as with creativity like the importance for play of not putting any pressure on the work having some some pieces of work or some areas of the creative practice where there's no pressure at all on the work and it's just pure exploration of materials so that's what these are really and often some kind of meaning and significance arises out of that uh, so here here they are a few images and i like playing around so i create many of these strips and I like playing around with the arrangement of them. So there's a couple of different arrangements there. And some more sort of subtle ones there. Claire, can I ask a question? Yeah, please you do. Say, yeah. saying, you're saying that meaning and significance can come from these um, playful experiments. Yeah. Um, how do you, what is the quality of something that's got meaning and significance or so how do you know that's a lovely that's a lovely question um i suppose it's helen there's a sense of um resonance there's a sense of something more than um something yeah something beyond me if you like something it's like almost as if the subject matter comes alive and has its own life and then it feels as though i'm participating in something rather mm. than doing something so so do you feel that it comes that it's meaning and significance and comes as you're making it or is it when you look back on the drawings um that you realize which ones have a sort of sense of meaning and significance i'm just aware that somebody's not muted so if we if, if it's possible to mute again if everyone could mute themselves sorry helen could you say that question again <laughs> thank you yeah um do you, do you find the significance comes in the process of making and you know then or just after that that's um, an image that's meant something or is it when you look back on your drawings later or your images? 
I can feel it. I can feel it as it's happening. It sort of reminds me of what Matisse says when he says something like, um, there's a sort of a, a sort of power of resistance that arises. I, I don't think I can capture what he says actually. Um, but uh, Matisse talks about it too, this significance or resonance. And um, I can feel it. I can just feel there's a sense more of a sense of aliveness and perhaps even a sense of um, magic, but certainly a sense of aliveness. Yeah, in the moment. Yeah. I wanted to show to show these because um, yeah, some of my work is very, very light, as, as you've seen. It's in, in in many ways, it's all about. There's a lot that there's a lot about light that's significant in my work. But also, um, there was a period when I wanted to do some black paintings, and I did some of these also around the beginning of lockdown last year. And um, I remember Malievich, the the early abstract artist Malievich, around the beginning of the cent the last century, the early nineteen hundreds. He said that um, black, the color black, is light interpenetrating with matter. That's and he did a series of black paintings, and and what I find with the black paintings is um, that. I don't know, there's something soulful about them. I, it sort of gives me, it allows me to be with um, any sort of difficult feelings as well, but in a way that gives them respect. So with the black, that's the significance of the darker paintings. So what, what I'm hearing from you about how you talk about your work is that it's really not just about the formal um, aspects of the work but the, a sort of integrity to how you are and what's and what's going on in your life if you're or in your I don't know in your actually in your whole experience yeah um that needs to come out in in the work that's sort of even would it would you say sort of driving the work yeah definitely yeah. and and one thing one thing I've noticed um I'll just move to the next slide one thing I noticed a couple of years ago was that I started wanting to look at the master's work a bit more closely. I mean, I've always done transcriptions, copies of uh, Poussin and uh, Rubens, for example. I did some copies of their work when I was at the Royal Drawing School, paintings from their paintings. And I this is a piece of work that I did. Um, it's a copy or a transcription of Van Eyck's painting, which is in the National Gallery. And I, I was drawn to this, Helen, because um, I wanted to learn about natural materials. So you were mentioning integrity and allowing the work to come from there. Mm -hmm. And I, I was just really wanting to work with natural materials, natural pigments and so on. So I, I went and learned how to use egg tempera and oil, how to mix how to make the the pigments how to grind them down from rocks and earth and crystals and now i'm using egg tempera and the significance of that has been it's been quite surprising for me it, it's all about ecology and this has really surprised me it's just like i just don't want to add anything negative into the earth um, so all these all these materials now are um, they're they're um, they're non toxic and they are in harmony with with the earth. So that's very significant to me. And when so in using these materials, do you, do you buy sort of raw pigment and then um, make it into work a uh, form that you can use? Yeah. I buy, so I buy the pigments, yeah. yeah. So you're, you're starting the process of creativity in a way but much earlier than, say, for, for me, just I squeeze my tube of paint out. <laughs> so there's a bit, there's a sort of um, a longer relationship with the materials that you're using, isn't there? When you mm. There's a the kind of, of you start using them. 
sorry Helen sorry yeah yeah no you you speak there's a kind of devotion I think in it for me and, and it sort of reminds me of what Maggie Hamlin says about art she says that art is about feeling and it's about love and uh you know the materials are part of that uh, these materials, some of them have got very special qualities. They're from crystals, so, so they have a certain energy to them as well. And it, I looked at some of my acrylic paintings next to these, and they've got so much aliveness in them. Uh, in the actual physical material is very, very alive. And um, there's something about love and cherishing and, and loving the materials as part of preparation in a way for for the express the expression i think and um so the devotion that you're talking about is that the make the making the act of making is sort of a devotional act that partly includes uh devotion to what the earth is sort of given in terms of these materials or yeah, well, that's that's a lovely question. I mean, I haven't thought it through, really. It's just more of a an intuitive response. But I suppose that is how it is, really. A sense of care or a sense of respect. Yeah. So, yeah. So these are all quite small pieces, these ones. Um, they're all um, like 30, 16 by... 30 inches something like that you can find them on my website if you want to know the exact sizes you can find the exact sizes there i wanted to just show the images rather than having a load of words on the screen but i've also been doing some larger drawings um, and i've been inspired by leonardo da vinci with this so he uh, this is an image by Leonardo da Vinci called the Vitruvian Man, and it's a symbol of um, the human being, the uh, yeah the human being's unity and harmony with nature. And I see that um, mindfulness practice um, is, is is on one level it's about getting to know ourselves. It's about learning to know what supports our creativity and what hinders it and putting in place things that really, really support it so that we can flower and flourish and, and grow and enjoy our creative lives and sort of diminish the, the negative impact of the judging mind and things like that. But, um, but it also represents something much more than that it represents a, a vision really of of really real deep integration and harmony with oneself and with the whole of life and it's that that i'm um i suppose exploring through this image of the uh, vitruvian man i'm now making drawings on that scale so <laughs> i don't know what you think of this this is a bit rougher than my the other pieces that um i've been working on so i work on smaller pieces and i love working with light and the brushes and the these organic materials and i'm also working on a larger scale now on the scale of this vitruvian man so with my arms outstretched and my my arms yeah so it's the full full body scale and uh working with in this case this is mud dug up from <laughs> A sort of special place um, that I go to, and uh, and this is a, a drawing of a, a mandala, really. Uh, so I'm just starting these big drawings and having a lot of fun doing it. Drawing with uh, all all the different parts of my body, so including my my feet as well. So this is very much an area of play and exploration at the moment. I think we're all gonna um, after this talk, Claire. Everyone's gonna go home, go out into their garden, and start um, digging up mud and <laughs> throwing it all over. The place. <laughs> it's very appealing. <laughs> yeah, and th there's something about working on this larger scale. You can see here, I'm working on the floor, so I'm actually working on the horizontal again with brushes, with um, with the natural pigments, with raw linen. 
And um, there's something about working on this scale um, that sort of stimulates this quality of openness. Uh, in mindfulness, the quality of openness and curiosity is very, very important. And uh, with engaging the whole of my body, it, it sort of seems to engage you know, more of me, if like emotionally and sort of on every level. So I find it's very interesting to do that. But I'm also continuing with the smaller works because they do something of value as well, but in a different way. Yeah. So this is, this is a life size piece. Um, and this yeah. is a current piece that I'm working on at the moment. And there are little bits of writing I can see. Yes, they're, 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 yes, I don't often write actually, but um, I thought I'd take a risk and uh, try it out and I was pleased I did it. Mm. Yeah. So that's, um, I'm not quite sure what the timing is, I'll just check. Yeah, okay. So that's um, all I need to share for now, I think, unless uh, you want, and there's some links there if, if any of you want to sort of see some more work, you're very welcome to do that. Claire, that was really, really, really nice to see. Um, and I just want to make a comment that, I mean, we've been talking about your process and um, the, the way you approach the work in terms of your own being and, and the materials, but the, but the result is there for us to see, which is beauty. And we didn't really talk about beauty, but the, um there's just a, a real appeal to those images um to all of the images that you've shown yeah very very captivating that, that's my response anyway so mm. um yeah thanks very much thank you well thank you very much i think i think i think beauty is yeah it is important very important for me and um it's sort of like well some aspects of life aren't beautiful, are they? They're, they're very challenging, they're very terrible, actually. And uh, one of those pieces was created uh, during the uh, anniversary of 9-11, actually. So I found it quite meaningful just to turn towards that and just, well, what, how do I respond to this? How do I respond to, um, to this with love, you know, with, without turning away <laughs> so sometimes I would choose you know to have a subject to sort of a backdrop for the these abstract pieces as a way to sort of expand my mind and connect me more into a, a deeper um, relationship I suppose with with life other humans and the predicament we're in or the, the the situation we're in in all its beauty and all its at times uh, difficulty, yeah. Mm. Mm. Thank so you. Should we, yeah, it's a pleasure. So there will be opportunity later on for questions, folks. So if you want to, you can jot them down, save them for us, and um, we'll have about 15, 20 minutes at the end if you want to went for questions. So but we thought it would be worth <clears throat> carrying on and uh, sort of having a look now at some of Helen's work. Um, are you happy to, to share? Okay. Dreaded screen share. Another mindful pause, <laughs> which we've programmed in for you all. <laughs> Okay, can we see a messy studio? Can someone say yes? <laughs> Is that working, Claire? Yes, it is working. Yeah, thank you, good, good. Okay, so I thought I'd start with just an, an image of my studio, partly because I love seeing um, images of other artists' studios. So I haven't been here very long. Um, I'm sort of in the process of making it my own um, but it's 
uh, having a place to work wherever that is a corner of a room desk or a studio space is um, quite important to me um, oops, gone too far have I gone too far yeah and um I really uh, well this is just another studio wall and um I started I've dug out some old drawings recently I like mentioned before trained at the, the Royal Drawing School um, and yeah just so many hours of life drawing and also getting to know London by drawing out and about drawing in museums so realized I've got all these drawings which are a resource a really incredible resource and, I mean it's wonderful to have so many figure drawings actually and I do include figures in my work so I've lately just been spreading out a load of old a load of work and I, I often have a lot of my images source material sort of around me. Um, so now I will show you some paintings. Uh, yeah. My work tends to be very small. Um, so I work primarily from observation, sometimes memory, um, imagination. And this is developed from a sketch that I did when a uh, visit to Spain quite a few years ago. I'll just um, march through some of the images just so you can get an overview of the kind of work I do. Could I ask a question, Helen? Yeah, of course. <clears throat> so do you do these pieces uh, so you you do sketches actually in in the in situ, yeah, I yeah, do. yeah, and then the, the the paintings that I've been showing you so far are oil painting. That's my main medium. I like like watercolor, um, and this shows the process. So um, this was also in Spain. I, I saw these guys playing in a, a square in Madrid, I think it was, and I can't find the original line drawing. So uh, I was walking around and I did a quick sketch of them in situ. I got back to my hotel. I did a little watercolour while it was fresh in my mind. And then that um, something really struck me about the, these two guys just sitting on a chair in a square. Uh, and I wanted to keep using the motif. So um, I think that helps describe my approach. Uh, maybe I'll just keep it on this bit, these ones for a minute. I'll talk about my approach. Just, um, I just feel like the, the world is full of little combinations, little random combinations of place, people, um, arrangements of things. Um, and when I'm aware, I, I notice them and they sort of become emblematic in my mind. Um, so I, I sort of... Uh, I mean, there's so many, I sort of got this kind of um, thirst in a way to, to honor the beauty in the world that I, that I see. Um, and uh, once, I, once I come across an emblem, I, I sort of make maybe quite a few different paintings and only probably one or two will be successful. Um, I don't even know if this one's actually finished, I, I keep changing it, I'm not very, um, not very final when it comes to my paintings, unfortunately. Yeah, um, and this is this is. I've got a few different work. I, I haven't got one way of working, so I included this because it's a bit more playful. It's a response to a part of the Giotto painting, um, but water is a theme that I I would like to um, pursue more. Um, yeah, Helen, do you go out looking for? um subject matter or does it come to you um if it doesn't come to me then i'll go looking for it and in a minute actually i'm going to show you some drawings that i did in lockdown where it felt like the images came to me so it does depend on where i am um so this is another painting that i drew from um my trip to spain and that trip was definitely I wanted to see paintings in the Prado. Um, I went on my own and I was definitely drawing in order to get source material. Um, but sometimes 
you know, I live in Bethnal Green. Um, I've got a view onto a quite a busy street and it, it feels like I can just um, look and uh, source material will come. Um, in fact, in fact, in some ways, I've got a studio about 20 minutes away. In some ways I'd prefer if I had the space to work from home because, because of where my house is, the sort of things that I'm interested in, which is people going about their business. Um, I'm like a nosy neighbor really. Um, people, I think there's something about people um, being unselfconscious in their activity that I really, really respond to. It's quite different from um, the model in the studio or the posed um, portrait or something. Uh, yeah. This reminds me of um, what you, your statement, what you said about mindfulness when you first introduced uh, yourself at the beginning of this session, was you were talking about mindfulness as a, as a way of turning towards the, the everyday and sort of seeing the value and the, perhaps the beauty as well, or would you say? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm concerned with beauty. Uh, I respond to beauty um, and I think that's it. And I think, I think there's, that sort of unselfconsciousness can be of people talking, responding to each other, um, can just be very, very beautiful. Um, and it sort of feels like the world is kind of a, a stage or something where we all go, we all move about and the, the, there are all these, um, I don't know, scenes and, uh, there's all this potency, I suppose. Yeah. Do you find that um, both, I mean, it sounds like your mindfulness practice is so much inter interwoven with your art, they're not separate in a way. And I'm just wondering, like when you go around walking outside, looking, it sounds like you look through a particular set of eyes when you're looking in this way, you're actually, can you say a bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, I, I, probably everybody's had this experience as well. Of you're not, maybe not even always looking, but suddenly something catches your eye and it's mysterious in a way, like what it is that makes it sort of more um, potent than other things that are going on around. So um, I'm often caught out without my sketchbook um, and I, I I wish I wish I'd been there to record it, and I might try and I might really really try to sort of remember it and draw it when I get when I get back home. Um, so it's not that I'm always actively searching, and I think what I would say is that so often the things that happen sort of out of the corner of my eye. That are more interesting and that's even the same with the process of making artwork so for instance i might be doggedly really trying to draw something um, spend ages on it or make a painting and then i'll do a little quick exercise or a little quick drawing after that and that will be much much better so it's like all this focus uh, and over attention will go in one area and it's like i need to do that um and then then i'll just lighten up and um be less um willful or something or less concerned and, and that's when um the sort of fruits of that effort come in so and i was thinking about absorption you know i might be really really absorbed in quite a bad drawing <laughs> for quite a long time so absorption isn't the only quality of mindfulness i think that i like responding to what you're saying about playfulness as well that there needs to be something a bit a bit less sort of a bit more balanced i think in, in the uh, effort yeah so when you're um, when you're working and you're you're sort of drawing your subject matter you're spending time with it getting to know it through um through your drawings um do you do, do you sort of consciously bring in any mindfulness practice or is it just sort of like part of you in a way? Yeah, that's a good question. I think 
I think that drawing is a mindfulness practice. Um, and because I, I started sort of more intensively practicing mindfulness learning meditation around the time um, that I intensively, uh, like for instance, studied at drawing school, although the seeds of both were there before that, I began to see the parallels between, between the two and that some activities are really conducive to bringing about mindfulness. You don't need to um, think of them as mindfulness isn't really a technique. There are techniques that help us to find a quality of mind that we call mindfulness, but um, with, it's not a technique on its own. So drawing requires us to be present, to be sensitive, not just to the visual world, but to how our body is. And there's all sorts of uh, little um, bits of information that if, we, if we're attending, um, that will come out in the drawing. So I, I, feel, I feel like that about it. Um, and probably my drawing practice has been enhanced and by, by mindfulness practice. And I, in the studio, I definitely do deliberately um, do things to, to keep my mind clear so that I'm focused on, on the work so that I can sort of reach that point where I'm, I'm really um, involved in my work. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I hope that makes sense. I, these two drawings, um, I just, this is just a work in progress, actually. I mean, I'm slightly mortified that I even put it on the screen, but there we go, warts and all. Um, uh, but I, I thought today just to show um, really how how drawings develop, how paintings develop. So this was in lockdown. I might in a minute show you some of my sketchbook. I also work from collage, which is something that I discovered a few years ago. Um, I mean, it's the most fun, the most fun thing you can do, I think, collage. <laughs> and, um, but it also allows me to be a bit less um, literal about the world. Um, yeah, it, and it allows more colours, that I, colour combinations. It allows something more imaginative to go on. This is a, this is a monoprint that I did from a, a drawing of a horse. <laughs> um, yeah, so... The, and this is a painting, obviously it's not very good quality, but this is a painting that um, came from a collage. So I'm still in the process of bringing that imaginative aspect in. So it's not that I only work from observation, but I would say that's my main um, practice. That there's other, I'm trying to explore how, how to bring in um, perhaps more imaginative um, aspects, yeah. I might, I think what I'll do now, I thought I'd share some of my sketchbooks as well. How are we doing for time? Yeah, we're doing fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, I'll just do this. Plan to change over. So I'm just going to spotlight. my second camera. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought um I thought it's nice just to actually see the sort of materiality of of things. So um well maybe I talk about lockdown actually. Um I found it firstly the first period of lockdown really quite uh potent time. Um, I hadn't lived at the house that I live in now for very long. I didn't have a studio. And then suddenly, um, you know, the world got very, very small. And everything in my diary was cancelled. So I had a lot of time. And I was getting to know this new place that I was living in. I don't know if you remember, but how sunny it was. So it felt like um, my world was suddenly reduced to this quite small space, but it was completely illuminated um, and, and everything looked very, very bright. It, it felt like quite a strong um, experience, sort of extended period, experience of mindfulness because of um, not having to attend to lots of different things. I didn't have anything much to attend to. Um, so I just got really into the domestic world of 
of where I live. And I'm just going to whiz through some sketches. Um, Could I ask Helen, yeah. that, um, when you're drawing from your environment in this way, does it change your relationship to your environment? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, it really does. Um, I mean, it, I think what happened is that my environment became a place of wonder. Um, you know, it wasn't just a, like a slightly tatty Victorian terrace flat, um, a bit like anywhere else. It, it, it just kept, became this really vivid world. Um, and that was in, that's both stimulated and was enhanced by, by drawing. Um, and I will use these these drawings as um, a resource for ages that you know I want to make I want to make paintings for them. Um, I'll just flip through my, my sketchbooks. Yeah. Uh, and that you know that that's a neighbour um, who became very familiar. She had no idea that she was featuring. <laughs> featuring in my work yeah so um, I, it just it felt like with, there were just all these compositions that needed to be found or something for something more in a sketchbook um yeah very very enjoyable uh, you know in a way you know such an intense time for all of us whatever our situation was and i i, I definitely benefited from from this um, forced retreat in a way. So so here we have um, some uh, what are they called these things? Tea towels. We have some tea towels on a washing line. <laughs> well, are. For most of us we could just ordinarily just not even notice them. It's a functional thing, isn't it? The tea towel. Um, but you saw it in a particular way. You noticed the tea towel, maybe the pre perhaps the quality of light falling on it. Mm. Can you say something about what drew what draws what drew you in? What draws you? Is it? I think it was. I think it was the light falling on it. Yeah. But also, um, I don't know, Claire, if you remember my bunting phase. So I, okay. I did have a bunting phase. I was painting a lot of um, bunting. Uh, and uh, something about the these ephemeral um, squares of colour uh, flapping about in the world that I, I find really really attractive. So I, I definitely think that 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 phase of painting that I'd previously had sort of either drew me to the tea towels or it's the same thing that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. um, they're a bit like prayer flags, Tibetan prayer flags. So, um, these kind of yeah, I don't, I don't really know. I don't really know what to say. That the quality of these ephemeral things yeah. um, and the way the light falls on them. I mean, the sunlight was just particularly capture, capturing it. Mm. One thing I notice, you know, when I do look at your work regularly, I notice that I do start to sort of look at the world around me in a different way. That somehow by some sometimes I've sort of seen through your eyes, you know, seen the poignancy or the the spaces between things happening. So there's all the activity of life, isn't there? And then there's sometimes these little spaces that open up, which seem to have this sense of wonder. Yeah. Um, which in a way is what we're trying to explore through mindfulness, isn't it? Sort of not taking things for granted but sort of trying to see life afresh with, with, uh, and valuing it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, and it's my sincere belief that, you know, any situation that, that is available, even, even very, very difficult situations. Um, yeah. so there'll be some, something, <laughs> it might be very, very small, but yeah. that becomes emblematic for, for positivity, for, I don't know, beauty, yeah. uh, re representing something much bigger than itself. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, like these tea towels mean, they don't really mean tea towels to me. I don't really know what they mean. But <laughs> something. So do, you find, do you find that the sort of contemplating beauty and these moments of wonder in this way, that it helps you to integrate and manage and bear the more difficult aspects of life as well? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it, it's interesting hearing about you talk about your work and somehow that that seems much closer and more integrated in the actual work than perhaps I would think about my own work. I think, I think how I would think about it, and maybe this is the same, I'm not sure um, is how you feel about it, but for me it's like despite, despite this, despite my terrible mental states or despite um, the bad things happening in the world, there's this. Okay. And when I'm drawing, I can often be both very, very distracted and preoccupied and present at the same time. And I think that's how I feel like, ah, oh, there's, there's, there's a wandering mind that's partly trying to driving me nuts and saying the same things over and over again and there's something else going on that's much more precious and i'm just going to allow that to take um more space okay yeah. so it sounds like there's um with your mind training you've, you've trained you sort of trained your mind or you're you're continually working with the, the mind training the the meditation mindfulness practice to um to kind of see to 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 choose what aspects of your experience to focus on in order to in order to what <laughs> um enrich my experience i suppose yeah. or, or to yeah. realize maybe that's more it to realize the richness of experience that's there yeah. yeah yeah lovely yeah and to not get bogged down by um difficulty yeah yeah yeah, exactly. Yeah. Lovely. And those difficulties can be big or just very, very silly and small, but they still um, yeah. experienced as difficulties. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Lovely. Yeah. Should we should we move into talking about our teaching in a moment? Yeah. Great. Yeah, that, that's um all I am um, it's um yeah just really appreciate helen you sharing your work with us I, I'm, I'm kind of intrigued to see what others think and uh, to have some questions shortly but before we do that we could just sort of say a little bit about our teaching practice and um and sort of what we teach and and why we why we do it yeah. do, you want, do you want to start helen sure yeah i can i can try and say something um I mean, I think my teaching practice, to start with, I just want to say how grateful I am for all the teach, drawing teachers that I've had, um, who, you know, their, their practice won't be based in the discipline of mindfulness, but they do have this extraordinary sensitivity um, that expresses itself in a very similar way. So, so... There's something around bringing bringing what I've taught, been taught into um, into my own teaching, and perhaps an emphasis whereby we're trying to look at the state of mind that produces um, a drawing that we're happy with, rather than only focusing on technique. And I don't think technique is separate. But it's like, what are we doing with our minds that inhibit our drawings? Um, and what can we do? What are we doing with our minds that um, allow our draw drawings to grow and flourish? And, and what are the ways into creating that? Um, I think that what I really want is people to enjoy uh, drawing. In the, yeah, and to feel like, I want them to people to enjoy drawing and feel like it's a language that they're allowed to use you know that, that sometimes I think people feel like drawing is for people who can draw or something uh, and I don't really 
I don't really agree with that. Um, you know, everybody talks. Um, some people talk very, very well, and some of us talk, struggle sometimes to, to say the right thing or something, but it's a language we're, we're all permitted to use, and I want drawing to be the same. Hmm. Yeah, so it's a, yeah, and that's really possible, isn't it? You probably yeah. notice that again and again. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. and, and, yeah, and mindfulness. It's just um, exactly those qual those qualities of permissive entering, permitting oneself to enter into one's experience without. Yeah, this, hor this horribly critical mind or something. Yeah. Can you say a bit about sort of how you teach that, you know, how you support people to really enjoy their drawing practice and. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I think partly it's it's doing a lot of warm up, I call them warm up exercises or, or like quite restricted exercises where you're focusing on one thing, particularly focusing on something where you're you're reducing the ability of the, the assessing mind to, to interfere. So, uh, you know, the typical example is a, a blind contour drawing where you're not looking at the paper, you're only looking at the object that you're drawing. And then, um, you know, and that's a classic art school uh, warm up. You do it in many drawing classes, but then drawing out the qualities of why why do people find that so freeing, um, and what is it about the mind that when we start thinking harder about the work, what is it about the mind that, that stops that freedom? So, so really drawing out the qualities and seeing if we can extend those qualities into more of our, more of our experience. Yeah, so, yeah, something yeah like that. that sounds great. Yeah, yeah. And what do you, can you say about what you teach? Um, what courses you teach? Oh yeah, sorry, yeah. That's probably what you're getting at before, wasn't it? No, it wasn't. It was, yeah, you know, you're spot on. I was wanting to, yeah. yeah. Um, well, the main t the main course that I teach at the City Lit um, is Mindfulness and Drawing Morning Meditations, which was actually born in lockdown. Uh, so it's an hour. The course is five, day, five days in a row, Monday to Friday. Um, and it's an hour each morning, eight till nine do some meditation, do some simple drawing exercises. And um, within that, uh, you're looking at different aspects of mindfulness each day. And the idea is that it's cumulative. Um, we just see how well-being um, can be enhanced and produced by having an hour where you're, you're not doing something practical. Uh, you're not doing the to-do list. Um, you're being reflective um, and um, creative. So. So that's the main the main course that I teach at the city that I also talk, teach at the Royal Drawing School. Mm -hmm. uh, similar material but different um, setup. Yeah. So really interesting way to like start the day in a way, like eight or nine, um, or a bit like morning pages. So it could yeah. be like a morning meditation, even doing the drawing. Yeah, exactly. And it's online, by the way. It's mm -hmm. online. And, and you meditate as part of that as well? You teach mindfulness as part of that? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Great. Mm. Thank you. How about you, Claire? It's so, your teaching. yeah. So um, at the City Lit, I teach um, drawing and mindfulness. So like Helen, I'm also teaching the drawing and mindfulness. And I teach tasters, so three hour tasters and um, one day workshops and a six week, six week course. And the six week course is uh, like three hours once a week, every week. And they are, they are really, I think, I really enjoy teaching them. And I think they're a lovely way to, to learn to draw or to develop your drawing. And um, to learn about line and tone and the materials. We use a variety of materials and we look at a whole load of artists' work for inspiration. And like Helen, I sort of really believe that, you know, anyone can enjoy drawing. And so there's a lot of play and exploration and an exploration of what you would find interesting, what each of 
this what each person would find interesting themselves and then building on their own interests and on their strengths so that they can um, I suppose feel comfortable and uh, with the materials they're using as well as the subject matter um, I look a little bit at the science of the mind um, as a way of um, for example understanding that the the judging mind uh, that we all experience is actually quite impersonal a lot of us sort of start feeling bad about ourselves if we start going into judging but actually um, neuroscience has now shown us that it's just a function of the mind it's a survival instinct from the brain it's a part of the brain a survival instinct from um, uh, from our evolutionary process and so um, what I encourage people to do is by looking at the science then we can kind of when the judging mind arises we can say oh thank you evolutionary process <laughs> <laughs> but I don't need you right now. And in a way, free us, free ourselves from it just by noticing that it's it's not personal, that it's sort of part of the brain and that actually we can rewire our brains. This is something absolutely radical about mindfulness as well, is that we can rewire our brains. We can train our minds to think and feel differently. And neuroscience uh, has shown that. And I'm sure Helen you know, can also concur that, I mean, my, my brain has changed. It's like I've, I'm definitely a different person 27 years on, thankfully. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so it actually really works. Uh, recommend it. And, um, and we have breathing. So we explore different mindfulness tools um, and different drawing, playful drawing exercises. Um, we would look, would look at the breathing space. So integrating breathing spaces into the practice, um, looking at speed, different speed of drawing. Does it, what supports you to be present? What supports you to be connected to your materials going slower? or going, going faster sometimes, so it varies. Um, and I really, um, probably the main thing that I do, and I, I teach this in all my classes, but particularly drawing and painting the imagination, which is also a six week course that I teach at the City Lit, really encourage people to learn to trust themselves to trust in their own experience um, and to, in a way, listen inwardly to um, their own inner guidance, particularly when it comes to accessing the imagination. Um, and um, we work with, um, yeah, I suppose, well, actually, I'll leave, I'll leave it there, Helen. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, can I ask you if, you're, if there's a relationship between your teaching and your own work where, where that yeah where they influence each other well I mean I suppose I worked from observation for so many years um so I do teach drawing from observation in the mindfulness drawing but also now working with abstraction so I teach quite a lot of mark making just playing with mark making and exploring materials um and connecting to presence connecting to um, the present moment and presence through the materials and and just how the imagination in a way you illustrated it perfectly in your work how the imagination can just naturally arise this process of like resonance or wonder or magic just naturally arises actually through um through becoming more and more present and alive to our materials as well as our subject matter so it's sort of it all comes it's all it's all connected isn't it do you find that yeah yeah i do yeah but and i, I also find my teaching um stretches my own drawing because i ha i have to I suppose it, it forces me out of my my habitual way of drawing because i often draw while i'm teaching so then i'll do the do the exercises that i'm recommending mm. um uh so I, I, I actually make discoveries as well in the, in the classes that I'm teaching. It, it, um, 
it, dem it demand, I think it's quite useful having an external demand. Um, I find it very helpful too. Yeah. It sort of completes a loop, doesn't it? It's sort of like one does things in one studio and then one shares it and then other people share their experience and it's everything grows understanding. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. Should should we um should we pause there and yeah invite questions? Yeah. So yeah. we've got we've got 20 minutes until the end. Um so you could um you could write questions in the chat or you could i see human has just raised his hand you could raise your hand that's also a really good way of going about it mm. so <sighs> should we take a question from human first yeah and then lynn has raised her hand as well okay i can't see that okay mm. great and I didn't think you'd see that immediately, but thank you. And thanks for um, sharing your artworks. It was both so inspiring. Um, your um, attention, Helen, and just Claire. Uh, I love the devotional idea. Let's check on. I have a little bit of a um, confusion when it comes to mindfulness. Um, I've, I sort of practice for the last 10 years intermittently. Sometimes I, I, I stop for months, but then I'll do like 10 minutes a day and get into it or not. Um, and it's this um, dichotomy between mindful awareness of what's going on and sort of noting what's there without moving towards a particular state of mind. Or this heightened idea of um, mindful being, and this other state, this other state of being absorbed in something, such as a movie or a thought train, or playing football, whatever it is. I, I don't. I don't want to put things in categorizations too much, but I just wonder what you think about those two different things and how it, how you, you talked about skillfully kind of negotiating these, the, the critique, critique, et cetera, but I just want to know your thoughts about those two different things, both of you. Um, could you, Haman, could you just very briefly mention the first one again, just for us? Yeah, so one is, um, being accepting and aware of what's here yeah whether it's feelings of distracted uh jitteriness and that being what you are experiencing yeah you know so not not moving towards an exalted state of like yeah <laughs> i am at one with my art or whatever um, so that's the first one, accepting different mindsets. And then the other one, which you also touched on, which is just like stopping the crit criticism and really paying attention. I, ooh, I'm not sure if I'm explaining it right. There seems to be a little bit of a uh, dichotomy there. Mm. If that's the right word. Maybe yeah, it's, it's too like obscure one... the question. It's Sorry. as if like the first one, you're not intervening, you're just, you're noting, you're, you're, uh, you're coming into a state of awareness, awareness where you are just noting uh, your, the arising, the arising in your mind, but you're not doing anything with it. And the second yes. one is where you are actually having some agency on where to place your attention. Mm. yeah 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 so i mean they're both very 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 valuable parts of mindfulness practice and they both are regarded as mindfulness practice mm. yeah yeah do you want to say anything helen to add to yeah that? Um, i was thinking that it, it's just very good for us to do activities that absorb us so like a, uh, you, you're saying about playing football or something like you know definitely that will have a good effect on on the mind 
Um, and then in, so, so this isn't really principial, but I'm just sort of thinking about the, a couple of the examples that you've mentioned of watching a movie. I think, I think that is where that's really, really interesting because I think it depends on why we're watching the movie um, and what we're doing and what kind of movie it is. So I, I certainly know when I've watched something, yeah, like a little bit low grade in order to avoid my experience and uh, I'll notice the deterioration on my mental states. You know, the next, if I watch it late at night, the next morning I'll be like, why have I got all these ridiculous images of this thing that I watched? I don't, I don't actually want that in my mind. Whereas if I watch something that, I, you know, that a, a movie that's high quality, it's got a vision, um, you know, I feel that I have to actively sort of partake in watching them. Um, the impression that the effect on my mind is one, one of uplift so there's like why am I doing that watching movies and also what's kind of what's the activity and I think you know the, the things that we could be absorbed in that actually aren't very good for us as well so absorption is not the only, the only thing yeah yeah so, I think you kind of were talking about this kind of skillful negotiating yeah yeah, yeah. Like, like a soldier would be very focused, but, um, you know, the act might be a violent one. <laughs> Which is, so that is, it is cutting off another part of the mind to do that. Yeah. Lots of questions anyway. Uh, probably move. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your question. Should we go to Lynn? You, you yeah, next? sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, I've got a nature about the compulsive sort of nature of appreciation of things. So I was talking to a friend recently about drawing in a cafe when you, you, you're suddenly drawn to something like the gap between two people or something. And, um, and recently I've been trying to appreciate litter. So I've, I've got quite obsessed with litter of taking photographs of it and collecting it. But and I love doing it, and there's something is something something really reflective about it. But there's also an agitated state sometimes that doesn't seem quite right. And I don't know if that's the, as you say, the horrible critical mind coming in. But um, it is crowding out my studio at the moment. It's like all the stuff I collect when I go on walks, and it does make me quite anxious, you know, because like, oh, what am I doing? And I mean, that, that, is, that does fit in with my mindfulness practice as well. You know, trying to appreciate everything, everything that arrives. Um, I've got quite upset about people having a go at people about litter and sort of thinking, well, I don't want there to be litter everywhere. But um, yeah, so that's, that's mainly it. So, you know, this sort of, um, a lot of people I know do, do art talk about the compulsive nature of it really. And um, yeah, I just wondered if you had anything to say about that, really. Yeah, well, well, I, I can, I can recognise that, Lynn. I can recognise that from my own experience, and I see Helen nodding as well. <laughs> so, I mean, we do have compulsions, don't we? We, we all have them. It's part of being human. And um, how do we manage it? And I mean, one thing I do is I if I do notice that sort of um, well I suppose there's two things arising in my mind one is well what's a creative impulse what's a creative kind of compulsion <laughs> and what's a destructive one or unhelpful because they can sometimes feel a bit similar but you're talking about obsessiveness as well aren't you and um, I suppose um, something that starts as being creative can then become if you repeat it and repeat it then it then you start your alarm bell starts ringing and you realize yeah. okay something about this isn't creative anymore um it sounds like your awareness practice is allowing you to recognize that so it's sort of bringing awareness to the whole sort of length all our activities so that you can keep 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 things in check really i mean i i really 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 value the, the pause um Tara Brack calls it the sacred pause or just uh, so 
I incorporate, integrate pauses like through the day, just three minutes, three minutes here or there, sometimes longer, just to like, ah, uh, just to release that sort of charge. You know, we have that <laughs> the desire or the opposite of desire, just to sort of keep uh, resting the body and releasing it. And I think that sort of drip, 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 like little bits constantly has such a powerful effect. Uh, so I can't recommend that highly enough, really. Mm. I sometimes think it's an avoidance to something else. I suppose that's where the yeah, ad, and you can do that with med. You can use meditation, but you know, formal meditation that's yeah. as well. I do put it in my art, by the way. That's the sort of part aim of it. I can't possibly put all of it <laughs> anyway. Well, I could actually. Anyway, okay, thanks. Yeah. Do you want to add anything? No, I, th I think uh, I was thinking that the pauses, that's, uh, that's the key, I think. And, and when I notice when I really don't want to pause, that's probably when I'm like in the grip of some yes. kind of um, That's a good one. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. You really can't pause, yeah. but you know you should. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I can see Ratnadeva's hand up and I can see Esther's hand up. Mute. Do you want to go next, Ratnadeva? Sure. Well, thanks very much for the presentations. I found them both very inspiring. Um, question for both of you. Is there a role for ritual in your artwork and your teaching and your mindfulness practice? Can you say, Ratnadeva, a bit more what you mean by ritual there? Well, ritual is hard to define. It's, uh, I suppose you could define it as symbolic use of symbolic action. Yeah. Around, uh, uh, symbolic action that expresses an interior an interior disposition and and i imagine your painting is uh, your drawing is very much about expressing an interior disposition uh so i suppose i'm I, i'm prompted by the fact that i know you amita jyoti use ritual in terms of candles and setting up a space and uh, you didn't say much about it in your presentation and mm. I'd love to hear more about how you frame your activity with through symbolic acts. Yeah. Should I say a few things? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah you say something. Yeah. Um, do you, would you like to add something as well to this one as well? I'll say a short thing. Yeah. Okay. So. Yes. Um, it's a very interesting question. In a way, it feels like quite a, a deep question. Um, I'm not sure I can quite answer as fully as I'd like to at the moment, but uh, I think there's something about um, creating a clear intention with any with with art. With so. Um, so sometimes, for example, when I'm teaching, I'll ask people to reconnect to, well, their purpose. Why do they want to be drawing right now? So connect, reconnecting to um, their sense of purpose. And, and in my own practice, I do that, sort of reconnecting to, well, what do I, what would I most like to be an outcome of this period of making? And so I set that intention, well, I would like this to be the outcome. And, and by setting that intention um it helps to um to make that happen for that to become realized and i find that doing little rituals can support that so for example with the egg tempera um sometimes i'll use a particular number of eggs <laughs> i'm longing to get some chickens by the way <laughs> to do some some uh, anyway that's another story but um um i'm um i might use a particular number of eggs because there's a significance in a particular number so i might use things like that uh, or um sort of dedicate the practice dedicate the um the drawing to something uh or yeah so there's, there's a very big question there's probably a, a, a very very long answer in this um but what i try to do is use any ritual that i do use like lighting candles or uh so forth 
as a way to strengthen my intention and purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to say a bit more? Do you want to say? Yeah, I don't, I'm not particularly ritualistic, um, I don't think, but there's certain things you know, that I'll arrive in my studio and I'll always make myself a drink whether I want it or not. And then I'll do some <laughs> tidying up. It's like sort of, um, interacting with the space a bit. Um, I, I can't go, I can't go straight into to the process of making. I have to kind of circle circle around it a little bit. And then there are other sort of creative activities that I might use to stimulate my my sort of main practice. And when I've got this funny little activity of using making cards as a as my main sort of way of generating ideas. So birthday cards and things it's like I, I make them for people but they I'm also doing it for myself um, and I think that that's a way of um, getting into a, a way of making that's not not about me so the more the less it's about me um, the, the better the practice goes um, yeah so it, it's way, ways of um, sort of dispersing that like existential like I need to be an artist and I need to be a really good one um, kind of uh, mode that just doesn't <laughs> doesn't produce the outcome that it wants. <laughs> yeah. And yet, and yet sort of, you know, any action that any of us do any of the time can be sort of very meaningful for us, can't they? they, they it, we affect the world. We can, so, um, so, you know, our, rituals can support that as well mm. sort of the fact that we do have agency and potency i suppose yeah should we go to esther's question yeah. it might have to be the last one we're running out of time to see esther hello um i i would like to ask just for any last tips on working with the judging mind so it has been mentioned and i think helen was um talking about like ways of reflecting you know when the mind is going like that reflecting on kind of what it's doing um i was wondering if you had any kind of practical practical in the moment tips uh, to add that would be great thanks i i mean one of the things is to recognize it i think part part a lot of mindfulness is actually very simple but it's the, the recollection at the right moment, that's the hard thing. Um, recognizing that that's what's going on and recognizing it for what it is. And that takes a while to, in my experience, to really um, not buy into what the judging mind is saying. So I think one has to, there's a sort of um, firmness I need to apply or trust and say, you know, like this is what Claire was talking about, that it's not personal, not. Like I really have to buy into that idea that what my mind is telling me um, might not actually be true <laughs> and therefore um, it might not be helpful. So sort of those, those that conviction really that that, that might be a um, way to proceed. I don't know if that's a tip, but it's more of a sort of attitude. Mm. Yeah. I think that's a, a, a brilliant way of looking at it. Um, that your that the thoughts that we have are not always the truth. Um, some mindfulness teachers say thoughts aren't facts, so it's sort of like learning to unhook, isn't it, from the thought? And uh, yeah, as you say, Helen, sort of questioning it. And sometimes, um, what I would also do. Esther is is do a bit of inquiry like underneath a judging thought I often find that there's some kind of um, sort of uh, discomfort or even pain often underneath there's some kind of something's not in harmony something's not right in my experience so then I might just ask myself rather than getting involved in the judging thought which I've learnt is an illusion now to Sometimes, uh, sometimes I will listen to the thoughts, 
because it helps me to work out what I need uh, in order to support my creative practice and re-engage with my practice. But another way of working with it is just to go straight to the question of, well, what do I need right now? What do I need to reconnect to this quality of kindness and curiosity uh, so that I can, again, thrive in my work? I think another thing that I've also noticed is that I sometimes value it when the judging mind is coming in, because what I've come to learn is that it often gets stronger when I'm ready for a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. So if I can, so it's like the judging mind starts coming really in strongly and I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to really increase my compassion. I'm really going to increase my kindness, my awareness and my attention so that I can release this and, and, consequently rewire the brain in those moments um so i would incorporate more pauses like regular pauses sometimes like every 10 minutes a pause just to reconnect to kindness and curiosity and then carry on and uh it, it, sometimes it's sometimes it's just gonna be very active you know and other times but we, we can actually um, change our minds. So by, by keep bringing those beautiful qualities of mindfulness, of, um, of openness and curiosity and kindness, then we can, we can keep um, changing our mind in the direction we want it to go. And I think play as well. <laughs> Helen and I have talked a lot about play, but I think play is like probably the most important thing. Um, there's also a really good book. In fact, I'll just, shall I just screen share, Helen? Um, yeah. So we've got a screen share, a last slide for you, um, which has got some red recommended books and some uh, link to some of our uh, courses and our websites. So I think, I don't know if this is going to work, but you might be able to actually click on these on your screen. They might work. I'm not sure. If they don't, then um, you could do, you could just jot these things down. If you, if you were to do a search, um, you, if there's any books that you like the look of, you could just jot those down. But the book I really recommend, um, Esther, for the judging mind is Your Inner Critic is a Big Jerk. <laughs> which is very very funny <laughs> and also radical acceptance by tara brack which is the most compassionate book i think i've ever read <laughs> So we're coming to the end now. Yeah. We better say goodbye. It's been really, really nice doing this with you, Claire. And um, thank you for your questions, everyone. Shall I stop screen sharing? Have you all got the info you need? If you if you haven't got the information that you need from this slide, then just feel free to contact Helen or I. You can find us. Um, through our Instagram or our website. So um, you could just do a search on our names and you would be able to find us. So feel free to email us if you.